Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on Kibogo by Scholastique Mukasanga. This is a very, very good book and it's one I highly encourage folks to check out and read. The first reason is because Mukasanga thoroughly humanizes the characters in this novel. It's set in the 1940s, so this is a side of Rwanda that we haven't really seen portrayed in literature too often. Uh, we're, we're in a, a rural village there in the 1940s and we get to see what are the lives of these individuals like? What, what do they care about? Uh, what do they do? What kind of beer do they drink? What's it made out of? We get to learn all of these details. We see characters from different generations interacting. We see characters who have maintained ancestral traditions while we see others who are learning to sort of cope and, and experience and, and accept and move forward uh, and their life in a Belgian colony. We see the ramifications of World War II. We, we don't see the, the violence of, of a military war here at this time, but we see characters who are starving. There's a drought going on. So, so how do they move forward? How do they deal with this as a community and as individuals? And one of the things that Mukasonga really spends time working with is the idea that individuals and how they fuse uh, their identity to traditions from their past, but also begin to create and, and, and take and manipulate those traditions in new and novel and interesting ways. And so all of that comes together really well. And, and that's the first reason I loved this book. The second reason is that Mukasonga has this incredible sense of humor that she allows to just drift in just about every direction. At times it feels irreverent. Uh, there are various individuals, there are various religious beliefs that are satirized within this book. And not always super explicitly, but, but Mukasonga has a very fine eye for detail and a fine ear for the details of conversation and description that allow us to laugh uh, within the book. And that can be interesting to, to see characters grappling with the horrors of colonialism, to see characters who are experiencing a, a very repressive and oppressive um, evangelism from missionaries here, and, and yet to still find a sense of humor and be able to laugh uh, at, at the end of, of many of these chapters is really quite interesting to experience. Uh, but, but the third reason is the depth of detail, the symbolism that Mukasonga has steeped this book in, and the ways that she inverts and turns so many different ideas that we've seen in other works of literature and various religious traditions uh, to really produce a marvel here. And so I, I just cannot praise this book highly enough. But I wanted to give you a taste of how she writes. So we have a group of characters, um, sort of older men within the village, who want to bring rain during a drought, and they've gone off to find a Mukamwezi who, who is... Uh, in a sense, the, the last you know person clinging to their old uh, uh, local traditions and religious beliefs. And so they've gone and, and they've been told to meet her on this mountain. Hush, said Gatoke. I see her. She didn't deceive us. They're worried she, she wasn't going to show up after telling them to meet her at night. Mukamwezi's silhouette floated and undulated in the grain of the dusty fog, like a reflection in the flowing water of a river. At times, her pale face seemed to drift away from the rest of her body and hover on the swirls of mist. That's not her, said Tuari. It's her um, umuzimu, her ghost. We're done for. Still, little by little, the hazy form grew more solid, and soon they all recognized it as a flesh and blood mukamwezi. They also realized that that pallid gleam emanating from her, her forehead and cheeks was caused by the kaolin makeup coating them. Here I am, said mukamwezi, and I see that your fear of the Padre did not prevent you from coming. You are still Rwandans. Did you bring what's necessary? They showed her the tender ficus branch and the igikuba pot. I, too, have what's needed. And she showed them a small spear and a calabash half filled with hydromel. This is what we need, the Igikuba pot and the Incuba spear, the thunder spear. That's what we need to pierce the clouds. Under Mukamwezi's encouragements and mocking laughter, the five old men struggled their way up the mountainside. In the most difficult passages, they helped each other out, gave each other a push, clung to one another. Sometimes short of breath and heart about to give out, one of them lay down by the side of the path. Leave me here, he rasped to his companions. This is where I'll die and you'll find my corpse on the way back if the vultures haven't made off with my carcass. Mukamwezi asked the one carrying the gourd to pour a few drops of hydromel in the palm of her hand. She moistened the dying man's lips with it, whispering a few mysterious words in his ear. Apparently, it restored the supposed moribund strength and will to live. The pilgrims painfully resumed their climb. They huffed and puffed in vain behind Mukamwezi, whose feet skimmed over the stones of a dry riverbed, while the boulders seemed to bow, bow down or melt away before to let her pass. Mukamwezi stopped to wait for them and egged on the ancients as they clung to the slope. Come on now, stop dragging your feet like slugs. Remember that Kibogo rose into the sky like a prince. Kibogo is still a prince. We mustn't keep a prince waiting. The sun was rising in a halo of mist when they reached the summit. Uh, and so, so we, we see there, as I mentioned, the humor, the way that the character interactions are interesting, but all the detail, the, the, the way that Mukamwezi's entrance is so dramatic for these characters. 
Uh, and, and yet the, the irreverent way that she deals with these characters, and then ultimately to, to the reference to Kibogo, uh, someone who, who once, in a sense, was taken up by a cloud in a, in a flash of lightning in order to bring rain to this, this, this uh, land and this community, all of that works together in a really interesting way. Later on it goes, Mukamwezi disappeared. It was thought that she was hiding out from fear of being thrown in jail for sorcery. Some claim she had taken refuge in Burundi, in the scrubland of Kumoso, where people came from far away to consult her whenever the rain acted up. Others said she had crossed the Malagarazi River and its crocodile infested marshes, that she had stayed a long time in Buha, the land of soothsayers. There she is said to have shared or extracted the secrets of a fortune teller named Inangona, or she of the crocodile. Some credited her with the rain's return and even claimed she had been lifted into the skies and rejoined Kibogo, her husband. It was a story whispered only after dark, for no one dared tell it aloud in broad daylight. And so we have that opening scene, and then we see some years later, there's a young man named Akiezu who arrives and he grows up in the village, but he, for some reason, we find out why, was allowed to go study at the local seminary. But when he returns, he begins to, to create this new path. And of course, there are repercussions. That character is Akiyezu. His preaching earned him harsh remands, reprimands from the church fathers in the neighboring mission, who complained that he was keeping the faithful from attending Sunday Mass, which is an obligation for all Christians. They summoned him and told him in no uncertain terms that a simple minor seminarian did not have the right to preach without authorization from the Father Superior of the Minor Seminary or even the bishop himself. The missionaries alerted the authorities in Kabgaya who also grew concerned about their students' uh, orthodoxy, and especially about his mental stability. Still, the incident went no further, as Akiezu renounced his grand public declamations and contented himself from then on with preaching discreetly in the thick shadows of the sacred wood for the few women who followed, wherever he went. And Akiezu more and more begins to take on the characteristics and, and, and you know, uh, various references to Jesus Christ. In fact, his name, Akiyezu, means uh, a reference to the Yezu being how the, Rwand the Rwandans pronounce Jesus in their, their native language. And so the way that uh, Mukasonga takes various stories from the Gospels uh, and traditions around Jesus and allows them to, to be explored in this new way in the middle of the 20th century in Rwanda is really quite interesting to see the idea that he, he can't preach publicly, he does it in secret. There, there are women who attend uh, the, the, his you know, preaching, uh, some of whom are, are believed to have been prostitutes in the mines uh, out in a different community. And so all of these work in, in really interesting and fascinating ways. That, that's the depth that gives this book uh, so much symbolism to hang on to. So one last passage. The rainy season started that year with a storm so violent that the women and even the men, stricken with fear, implored the protection of Yezu, Maria, Riongombe, Kibogo, and all the spirits, good or evil. Some jangled rosaries, other scored rattles, or the bones of warthogs or of their ancestors. Children wailed in their mother's arms, who tried to pacify them by singing ancient lullabies between their own sobs. Clouds enveloped Mount Runani, turning it into a grumbling mountain of shadows and flames. For three days running, thunder, lightning, hail, and torrential rains beat down on the hillside. Rivers of mud flowed down the mountain paths, way, washing away several huts along with their inhabitants while others, smashed to pieces by the squalls, ended up without a roof or walls. Uh, and, and that description of the power that Mukasanga gives to so many pages in this book is just incredible. Um, like I said, I, I really enjoyed this. The final section of the book is really quite interesting because instead of showing the Rwandans um, sort of taking the, the, the fusion of their ancestral tradition and then the Christian ideas that they've, they've been presented and, and uh, characters like Akiyesu sort of finding their own path forward in a fusion of those ideas. Uh, she, she moves forward again. We have one last time jump and we see the, uh, the, the Europeans arrive one more time now as academics to begin to study the cultures. And of course they want to attribute all of these horrifying uh, ideas around human sacrifice to the Rwandans. They want to misread what they're, what they're looking for as evidence uh, to back up the, these, these claims they want to make. Uh, they, they ask for the, the older men, hey, what, what are the ancestral traditions? And then they just, you know, what it, they, they get, find the story they want to hear and they pay that person. Uh, and so, so to see that is interesting and to see the way Mukasunga sort of turns her lens uh, on those characters and, and wants us to uh, examine their motives and, and, and laugh at times, but also see, see what's really happening. Uh, but, but she really accomplished something here. I'm looking forward to reading much, much more of her work. So um, thank you to Jen over at Remembered Reads for turning me on to this book. 
Now, of course, I was reminded of various works while I was reading. One of, was the great The Radiance of the King by Kamara Lay. I think this is one of the works in the 20th century that really gets into uh, examining the ideas of what it means to be African, uh, the way that Europeans view Africans and African identity. This is just an absolute masterpiece, one that I cannot recommend highly enough. Another book that examines life in a community and the way that characters sort of build their own, uh, take their own sense of myth and build their own identity out of that would be The Great Maru from Bessie Head. This is again, a, just a, an absolute masterpiece. A book that, that rem I was reminded of a lot towards the end was uh, The Chosen Place of the Timeless People by Paula Marshall, uh, a book that explores a, a Caribbean community and what happens when all of these well-meaning, you know, academics and, and scientists show up and just unleash upon the, the community there. And then finally, I think another writer who, who is able to deal with a very serious subject matter uh, and do it with a very <laughs> incredible and brutal sense of humor at times would be Percival Everett. Uh, I'll be looking forward to reading Dr. No in the very near future, probably next month. But I was also reminded of the many works that uh, allow writers to examine uh, th their conception of what, what would happen if Jesus Christ returned and was, was in our, our community right now. What would that look like? Uh, an African who did that was Nguji Watiango with Devil on the Cross. This is just a, a horrifying work at times, but a brilliant, brilliant novel. Another uh, writer who, who sort of took 20th century philosophies and telescoped those back into uh, the first century of the Common Era would have been Parlagerkvist with Barabbas. Certainly, from what I understand about Light in August, the Faulkner novel that I read in my 50s, uh, this presents that idea of what happened if, if Jesus was a black man in the Jim Crow South. What would, what would, what would occur? And then certainly the two Russian writers, Fyodor Dostoevsky with the Grand Inquisitor, excuse me, from the Brothers Karamazov, and a number of uh, Tolstoy's short stories, Father Sergius, uh, what's the one, that, it's not the life that you save may be your own. I forget, the, the, there's the various um, stories though that Tolstoy tells about spirituals and, and Russian spirituals. And then finally the film, Last Temptation of Christ, I think Scorsese's attempt to, and Nikos Kazantzakis' attempt to try and understand as much as they can about that experience. Each uh, involves a, a creator trying to grapple with the, the unique uh, humanity of Christ. So this is one that I would really encourage folks to check out and read. Thank you.